My wife and I went to Japan for our honeymoon. I'd studied there for a while during college, so I knew the language pretty well, and we were financially stable enough to afford it. We had planned on exploring all of Tokyo. Being one of the largest and densely populated cities on the planet, it was almost like a world of its own. A country within a country with diverse districts that might as well have been their own towns. For the first four days, we visited almost every part of the city, from the anime and manga shops of Akihabara to the trendy department stores of Shibuya to some downright bizarre-themed cafes in Harajuku. But after spending so much time in the crowded city, we decided that we needed a little change of scenery. There were a bunch of parks in Tokyo, but they were all crowded by people who had the same idea. We wanted to take a proper hike in a forest to clear our minds after all the excitement in the city, and the closest national forest was a Okigahara, a place most famous for people going there to commit suicide. Needless to say, we decided to go somewhere else. But with the way things turned out, it would have been safer if we had went to the suicide forest instead. On the fifth day of our honeymoon, we took a train ride to Kyoto, a city famous for its adherence to ancient Japanese culture in contrast to the modern metropolis that was Tokyo. We found a mountainous forest with a hiking trail in the rural area and set out to appreciate the natural beauty of Japan. The rough path took us up the mountains. Flanking us on either side were towering green bamboo trees that made the vibrant purple and pink of the occasional wildflower, or Sakura Blossom, all the more striking. We walked the path until late in the afternoon, at which point we decided it was time to call it a day. But on the way back, something among the bamboo caught our attention. A fox was watching us from the bamboo forest with blue eyes that almost looked like they were glowing in the shade. This wasn't the typical red fox you could find all over Japan. Its fur was smooth and a shade of shiny silver I'd never seen on any animal before. Naturally, we both took out our phones to take a picture of the anomaly of nature. The moment we did, it darted back into the bamboo forest. We knew it was a bad idea, but the color of the fox was so beautiful that we couldn't help but try to follow it for a picture to show off to our friends back home. The fox was fast, but not so much that we ever lost sight of it. We were able to glimpse the back of its unusually big bushy tail as it scurried in front of us, gracefully darting in between the bamboo trees as we clumsily tried to keep up. We arrived in a clearing in the forest where a traditional Japanese cottage sat next to a waterfall that led down to a flowing river. We didn't even question why it was there or who would be living there. We were just relieved that we found some semblance of civilization after almost becoming a statistic. I knocked on the wooden pillar next to the rice paper door and shouted out a greeting in Japanese. Almost immediately, the door slid open and I was met with the second most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life, next only to my own wife. She was a fair-skinned Asian woman with coffee-brown, almond-shaped eyes and a flawless, delicate face that most women could only achieve through Photoshop. She wore a fine silver kimono, fitting for our equally traditional house, and greeted us with a small bow. Good evening, she said in Japanese. How may I help you? Her Japanese was fluent, but I could tell that there was a bit of an accent to it. It wasn't any regional accent I knew. If I had to guess, she kind of sounded like a Korean person trying to speak Japanese. We got lost in the forest, I replied in my own heavily accented Japanese. Can you please help us? She gave me a smile that made my heart flutter against my will. Certainly. However, it is getting dark and the forest is dangerous at night. Would you care to stay the night here until tomorrow instead? I can lead you out of the forest then. I translated the conversation to my wife and we agreed to stay over. She introduced herself as Hana and even offered to serve us food. I tried to decline, but she insisted, and both my wife and I were hungry from our hike anyways. The food was some sort of meat with rice, accompanied by clay cups of green tea. Though we tried to mind our manners, we ended up scarfing the whole thing down in minutes. It was one of the most delicious meals I'd ever had in my life. She then led us to a small guest room and laid out two small futons for us to sleep on. My wife fell asleep almost right away, but I couldn't for some reason. It was odd, since she was usually the light sleeper and I've literally slept through storms before. I felt an inexplicable urge to get out for some fresh air, so I did. I quietly exited the guest room. To my surprise, Hannah was still awake in the living room. More of the same food she'd served us from before was still on the low dining table and she was in the middle of eating it. I hastily apologized for the intrusion in stuttering Japanese. She told me that it was all right in the same soft, polite tone she kept since we met. When she told me to sit down so that she could pour me some tea, I saw no reason to decline. 
I won't go into detail about what we talked about. Long story short, she tried to seduce me as my newlywed wife was sleeping right in the other room. My hormones screamed at me to take her up on her offer, and I felt my body burning with an almost supernatural compulsion to take her then and there. However, it was all drowned out by sheer disgust at the thought of cheating on my wife. I declined her offer to sleep with me in no uncertain terms. She didn't seem angry about it. Instead, a look of surprise spread across her face. Do you really love her that much? She asked me. Of course I do, I replied. I wouldn't have married her otherwise. There was a tense moment of silence between us. At that time, her surprised expression turned to a look of sorrow. I almost felt bad about making her like that, but nothing was going to make me betray the trust of the woman I loved. I really do like you, Hannah said before standing up, which is why I have to ask you to leave. What? I asked surprised. Right now? Yes, she said firmly. Just follow the river downwards and you'll find a small town there. Don't worry, no harm will come to you and the moon is bright enough to light your path. Go now, take your wife and get out of here. I didn't dare question her with the way she said it. There was a strong tone of authority in her words that made me not want to defy it. I could have sworn that her eyes glowed blue in the dim light as she spoke too. I went back to the guest room and woke up my sleeping wife. I told her that Hannah just asked us to leave and we had to go now. She gave me an earful for getting us kicked out, but stopped when we returned to the living room. Hannah was nowhere in sight, and instead of the cozy cottage we'd arrived in, we were instead greeted with a derelict ruin covered in dust and cobwebs. Lying on the corner of the lifeless living room was the corpse of a man with strips of his flesh torn out of it, the cracked bones beneath him. His cheeks had been completely removed, revealing only toothless gums. When we looked at the low dining table we'd been eating from just hours ago, we realized where all that meat and teeth went. And the bowls that Hannah had served us were white teeth and bone shards, topped by strips of flesh that still had human-like skin on one side. And in those clay teacups was a foul black-red liquid that gave off a pungent metallic odor that could only come from days-old blood. We left the cottage, which had become a desolated ruin in Hannah's absence. With no idea of where to go, I led us down the river as per Hannah's instructions, and true to her word, we arrived in a small town where we met some very surprised people. They told us that the abandoned cottage up the river was cursed and that no one who'd gone there had ever come out before. They told us how lucky we were to still be alive and contacted the authorities to get us back to our hotel in Tokyo. We cut our honeymoon short after that night. My wife is still recovering from the trauma of what she saw in Hannah's cottage, but I'll be with her all the way. Hannah would probably approve too. Had I not been faithful to my wife, I doubt she would have let me leave her cottage alive. Hey guys, before starting the next story, I would like to suggest to you guys to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And if you have already subscribed, then you guys are awesome. Honeymoons are meant to be a time of love. A time to enjoy the woman who just said yes to you. A time to finally look back on and remember, but mine turned out to be the worst experience of my life. My name is Noah Michael, and this is my story. It started on the 17th of July, 2007. Me and my lovely wife, Adriana, had just had the best day of our lives. We were also planning on going to the best honeymoon ever. And after thorough planning, my wife had suggested a place called Hearts Crossed Lovers. It was an island resort that was out of the country, and she said she'd seen it in a magazine a while back, and she thought it'd be the perfect place for us to start the rest of our lives. I remember saying, the review said there's so much love in the atmosphere, you could literally die. I wasn't really into the location. All I knew was that if we were together, I would be happy. So we boarded a plane the next week, and we went to the island resort. We reached the island resort, and the place was beautiful. Everything from the atmosphere to the hotel to the activities. Everything really screamed love. We settled in and began the best week of our lives. We did numerous couple activities as we enjoyed ourselves. I remember telling her, you always manage to find the best places. She smiled at me and then replied, I also managed to find the best person I could marry. I remember smiling really hard at what she said. This is going to be the first of many beautiful moments we'll experience together. We had been at the resort for two weeks, and me and Adriana knew that we'll be leaving soon, as we had only planned to stay for a month. 
That evening, there was a program for couples that was organized by the natives of the island. When we got there, we were met with other couples, and when the program started, the natives began to dazzle us with their tribal dances and songs. It was truly a beautiful sight. After an hour, the program was coming to an end, and one of the natives took the stage to give the closing remarks. It was a woman, and she said, Now it is time to reveal the couple that Ubu has chosen. I was confused and I began to ask my wife, What's going on? And she said, Didn't you read the brochure? Ubu is apparently the founder of the island, and every ten years, he picks a couple he has seen that their love is the strongest. I remember still being confused, so I said, What? And she said, It's just a silly tradition done by the natives of the island. As I was about to ask another question, cheers erupted around us, and we looked to the stage to see native island women pointing directly at us, as we had apparently been chosen as the couple of honor. I was still confused and they began to decorate us with beads and seashells. I called a waiter aside to explain as my wife wasn't really explaining what was going on well and he said, It's a traditional thing done every 10 years by the villagers. Once they choose you, you will be taken by the villagers to see exclusive sites around the village and to participate in some exclusive activities. The next morning the activity started off with a drama acted out by the natives and it told a story about the founder of the island, Ubu. It said he found the love of his life on the island and he decided to share the love he found to the island visitors. The narrator said, And the love of his life told Ubu, My heart is so full of love for you and if I could give it to you right now, I would, as I know this love will diminish within the coming years. So if you could take it, my heart as it is ripe and full of love now, I will gladly give it to you. I was still confused and perplexed at everything that was going on as I didn't understand the cryptic story. Eventually, it was done, and we were taken around the village to see some sights. We were also given a weird concoction to drink. I was hesitant, but I didn't want to be rude, so I took a little. When we were done, the last place we were taken to was the Diamond Beach. The water was bewitching as it sparkled like glass. After that, the activities were over, and we finally began to make it back to the hotel resort. That night, while my wife slept, I stayed awake. I don't know why, but I felt really uneasy. It was 1 a.m. on the dot when my body fell completely limp. I was aware of my surroundings, but I couldn't move or speak. And that's when I saw them. A square trap door that was situated on the floor was opened in the middle of our room and numerous black figures emerged from the ground. They immediately carried me and Adriana. We still couldn't move, speak, or scream. As they took us down the trap door, we were taken through elaborate tunnels and we eventually found ourselves outside. I saw what looked like little stone altars and we were placed on them and they began to surround us. The scene looked like they were preparing for a ritual as eventually everything went quiet and a woman began to speak. Listen and listen well, chosen couple. You will now hear the full true story of our forefather, Ubu and his lover. As you see, Ubu knew that their love won't last forever as love is fickle and weak. It fades away with time. His lover knew this too, so the only way they could preserve their love was to harvest and cut out their hearts when it's fresh and full of love, so that their love will last forever. So wise Ubu did the needful and he carved out his wife's heart, the same on which we have kept for decades. She then proceeded to raise a jar. I couldn't make out what was in it as I could only see a few remnants of whatever was once in the jar. The woman then continued and said, Ubu then realized that he had to stay to appreciate the love he had been given. So he passed down the teachings to us and we have been following suit as we passed down the love to numerous lovers. Each of them raised a jar of their own and this time I could see clearly preserved human hearts in the jar. Some were rotting and some looked fresh. And that was the moment when I screamed. My wife Adriana began to scream too at that sight. I then heard the woman say, The concoction is wearing off. It's time to begin. And with that, she revealed a huge knife and she began to approach my wife. I began to struggle to move but I couldn't as what they had given us to drink was clearly potent. I watched my wife begin to scream as she told her body to run but it couldn't. And that's when the native woman lifted the knife and decided to scar me for life. I watched her carefully carve out my wife's heart 
and it didn't take long before my wife stopped screaming, and I saw her dead eyes stare at me. They then proceeded to take it and raise it in the sky. The native woman then said, Your love has been preserved, and it will be for many years to come. I then saw them use a little knife to carve a cross into my wife's heart. They then poured oil on it, and they proceeded to put it in a jar. When they were done, they turned to me and said, Sadly, you aren't as wise or as resolved as Ubu, so you can't appreciate what we have done for you. So, we will send you to be with your lover soon. I didn't scream or fight, as all I wanted to do was die, as I had already died inside when I saw them kill my wife in the most horrific way. They then carried me and my wife's corpse to the Diamond Beach, and they threw us into the water. As the waves carried us farther out, I felt the ice-cold water seep through my skin. And as I saw my wife's corpse float out of my reach, I felt anger fill me as they had taken away the love of my life. I tried to reach out to her body, but I still couldn't move my arms. But I wasn't going to give up. So with all my strength, I reached out to her and I held her corpse right before it was about to sink. I began to pull her as I fought the current. And with all my strength, I began to make my way to shore with her body in my arms. It was the most brutal and strength-draining experience, but I did it. And when we finally reached the shore, I collapsed. I began to hear some footsteps, and I was scared as I thought it was the native villagers. But it was a receptionist I had met at the resort. He saw me moving and rushed to my side. And the last thing I heard him say before I passed out was, I'll go get help. I woke up in the resort but in a different room and with a bad headache. I was surrounded by two doctors and a few cops. I immediately asked for my wife Adriana, but the doctor told me to be calm. I began to cry and with tears, I told them everything that happened. Later that day, the village was raided and everything I told them was true. As they found the shrine, the altars, and over 30 preserved human hearts. The investigation took place and it was revealed that the villagers had killed over 30 couples. I was given Adriana's body to bury, and taking it back home to bury was the worst feeling I ever experienced. 14 years have passed, and nothing has changed. People tell me that I'm lucky to be alive, but there is no day I don't wish that I had died with my wife, as the only reason I fought was to get justice for her, and even then, it wasn't enough. But even though I still stand and breathe, when those people carved out my wife's heart, they carved out mine as I feel nothing but emptiness in my heart. And I know it's the only feeling I will have for the rest of my life. It has been three years since I married my high school girlfriend, Camilla. It was like love at first sight with her. Our families didn't approve much because she is Asian and I'm American. Still, we stuck together. We saved up and got jobs to make our life better. Right now, we have a solvent lifestyle, but in the beginning, we didn't have much. We were ready for the struggle and to keep things low yet happy living, we did the fun things most cost effectively. And that's when this incident happened. I worked in the garage while she worked as a waitress in a small cafe at the beginning years of our married life. Like every newlywed, I wanted to take her for a honeymoon. So we saved up and decided to go snowboarding in the mountains. A guy in my garage told me about this old house that his brother rents. The house is located in the valley of the mountains. The only catch is, you have to share the space with another couple. I asked Camille about going there, and she hesitated at first, but looking at our option of going somewhere really serene and beautiful, that too, under our budget, seemed more lucrative. We did as we planned. My sister lent me her car, and we set off on a dreamy week amidst the snow. Camille and I were so happy. She was singing and laughing during the entire ride. The smile on her face lit up my world. After two hours, we finally started driving up the mountain. The white snow spread around us like vanilla ice cream dazzled our eyes. I even stopped the car and took pictures with Camilla. She played with the snow while I went on clicking photos of her. When we reached the location, we saw a wooden two-storied house standing under the long pine trees that were sleeping under the blanket of snow. Wow, isn't it beautiful, Camilla said. Yes, it is, I replied with a smile. I walked to the porch and took out the key from the hanging plant pot as mentioned by the owner. It seemed like we were the first couple to arrive because otherwise we would have found the house open. 
I unlocked the door with a key and we got inside, taking our luggage. The house was moderately nice. There wasn't much furniture inside except a big couch near the fireplace and two armchairs. The living room was cozy and cold at the same time. Two bedrooms lied in the house, one downstairs and another on top of it upstairs. We were told that the top one is booked beforehand by the second couple, so we were bound to live under them. Our room had a double bed, a small table, and two chairs near a wide glass window. The rest of the valley was visible from that window. A night sky full of stars was an added miracle to the view outside the window. When will the other couple arrive? Camila asked. The owner said today only. Maybe they're still on their way. I told her to freshen up and went to light up the fireplace in the living room. By the time I managed to start a fire on the damp logs, snowfall started outside. We brought canned tunas and ready to cook meals with us. I already knew there won't be many amenities to avail here, so we came prepared. I lit up a smoke and sat on the couch, just when the main door wide opened and a gust of cold wind entered the house. Well, hello there. A man in his late 50s entered the room with a pale, tall woman. The woman was quite old too, but her face looked uncanny dark with red lipstick. She was wearing a lot of makeup that even in those dim lights, I could spot easily. The artificial pink blush on her cheek made her look frequently weird at first appearance. The elderly couple closed the door behind them and I said, Hello, I'm Jack. You must be the other couple sharing this cottage with us. The husband smiled and replied, Nice to meet you, Jack. I'm Dave and this is my beautiful wife, Linda. Where is your better half, young prince? The woman asked in a squeaky voice. Before I could reply to her, the address, young prince, kind of startled me. I told them my wife is freshening up in the room. They looked at each other and said, if we don't mind, we can all have dinner together. At that point, I had no other option than to say yes. We are going to share this place with Dave and Linda for a week, so it's better to mix up and maintain a good rapport. They went upstairs and locked the door. I quickly walked to our room to tell Camilla about our neighbors. Camilla was wearing a beautiful blue long dress. She looked like a dream in that attire. I couldn't help but to go and kiss her. After sharing a brief passionate moment, I told her the other couple has arrived and they have invited us to join them for dinner. She asked me what they are like, to which I explained all details about our first interactions. I even told her the woman called me Young Prince, which kind of unsettled me. Camilla laughed about it and the woman couldn't help but flirt with me. We came out hearing a knock on our door. Dave and Linda were sitting in the living room. They have moved a table in front of the couches and created a dinner setup. Camilla and I sat at the table and shared our food with them. Things started quite all right, but as time passed, I realized something is very wrong with these two. Linda wasn't at all talking to Camilla. Her attention was on me. She was flirting with me in the creepiest way possible. Like, I was having a bite when she said, Oh, you got some ketchup on your lips. And without waiting for my response, she wiped my lips with her bony fingers. I could see Camilla getting disturbed by Linda's behavior as well. Not just that, I even saw her licking off that ketchup from her fingers while staring at me. On the other hand, Dave was constantly checking out my wife and it was the most awkward, uncomfortable dinner of our life. After a point, Camilla said, I'm feeling tired. Also, we have to get up early to go snowboarding. She got up with an angry face and said, Jack, are you coming? I got up at that second when Linda did something unexpected. She got up and came extremely close to my face. She looked me in the eyes like a psycho and said, I didn't know you are a puppet of this woman, young prince. Camilla couldn't keep it in anymore. She stormed in my direction and pushed Linda saying, back off, this is my husband and you are crossing your limit. Maybe you should mind your age. Go spend time with your husband if you have any interest in him. I tried hard not to laugh, but my girl, was on fire that night. As soon as we got inside our room, we had a night of amorous lovemaking. As I slept hugging Camilla to my chest, I still couldn't forget the bloodshot, angry face of Linda after she got insulted. But she had it coming, so yeah. Don't remember what time it was, but we woke up hearing loud sounds of furniture breaking and glass shattering in the house. What was that? Camilla got up all scared. I could hear Linda screaming. She was screaming and rampaging the entire house in furious anger. We also heard Dave's voice trying to calm her down saying, Please stop it, enough now. But Linda went on behaving like a lunatic. 
I slowly walked to our door and was about to put my ear on the door to listen to what she was up to when the sound stopped. She just stopped screaming all of a sudden. I placed my ear on the door and tried to listen more carefully. All of a sudden, someone stabbed a huge sharp knife on the old wooden door, cutting through the wood like butter. Luckily, my head was not on the same spot where the knife struck, and Linda spoke from the other side of the door. Did I get you, my young prince? <laughs> Camilla screamed in horror, and I backed off immediately. Linda went on kicking and stopping our door while cursing us like hell. We knew we won't be able to hold this door for long, and that's exactly what happened. She kicked hard and the dusty old door collapsed on the floor. Linda stood in front of us like a crazy psycho. I could see her wrinkled old face as she had no makeup on this time. She looked at me and then at Camilla. Within a fraction of a second, she picked up speed and ran towards Camilla with a knife in her hand. I jumped and got in between her while her husband grabbed her from behind. She screamed and kicked in the air. I'll slit your throat and cut your face off, you skinny bitch! Her husband somehow dragged her out of that room and without wasting a single second more, Camilla and I picked up our bags and stormed out of that house. The sun was rising and we could see the rays lighting up the dark valley. We drove out of that place and spent the rest of our honeymoon in a hotel. We didn't hesitate to spend on a secure stay to get some privacy after that toxic experience. Don't know what happened to Linda and Dave, but I hope we never meet them again.